Um, welcome everybody to uh, Learn Lounge by SpringPod. Um, if this is the first time you've come across SpringPod, we are an early careers network for young people who are considering their next steps, be it employment, apprenticeships, college or university. And as part of this new Learn Lounge series, we'll be bringing you lots of inspirational career stories and some insights from some well-known names. We had two fantastic guest speakers yesterday, international polar explorer Anne Daniels and best-selling author and maths expert Rob Eastway. We hope you tuned in, tuned in for those fantastic talks. If not, you can watch the replays on our Learn Lounge website. I'm Victoria and I'll be hosting this session of Learn Lounge. Um, just a couple of pointers before we start. The talk will take about 45 minutes. Please feel free to ask questions and engage with this webinar. Um, remember to tag us on social media with hashtag Learn Lounge. And finally, we'll be raising money for the Children's Trust, so please do donate. Today we are joined by the very talented Simon Esner and he knows all about building a successful business from scratch. With over 40 years of industry experience, Simon is a director at Westbury Street Holdings, the founder of On Common Sense, a professional trained chef and a true business leader. Simon has had a fascinating career journey. In fact, he entered the world of hospitality and catering at 14 and today he's helped build a billion pound company we're incredibly excited to have him with us today and i'm sure we'll all learn quite a few interesting lessons from his talk so um welcome to learn lounge simon hello Good morning. hello thank you and um, welcome to everybody thank you very much victoria yeah so you're obviously a well-respected business leader um, in the hospitality industry. Can you tell us a bit about your early days in this industry and maybe right back to where it all started? Absolutely, I will. And good morning again, everybody. Uh, so I started, uh, which is quite illegal nowadays in 2020, but back when I was a kid, uh, you were allowed in uh, school holidays and periods like that to go and work and, and earn a few quid. And I started as a kitchen porter or a washer-upper. Uh, and, and for a, a large group um, in London, in Tottenham Court Road, I lived in, uh, in London in those days. And uh, I had so much fun um, genuinely washing pots and, and dishes. And the reason I had fun is that I'd landed into an environment that I felt completely at home in. Um, I was not very academic at school. Uh, I think it's fair to say I was a bit of a troublemaker at school. I, I've tried to avoid as many lessons as possible. I don't, don't recommend that to anybody. Um, but I found uh, a home in the kitchen and um, my very first mentor uh, in, my, in my life uh, was a wonderful gentleman called Louis Mitter, who was the executive chef of the uh, group I was working for as a kitchen porter. And he gave me uh, some amazing advice and guidance and he, uh, he suggested that I, I really do knuckle down at school and uh, I go to college and I, I get the re required certif certification. Uh, which in those days was called a City and Guilds uh, uh, Diploma. Uh, so I did that, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and the years went on and I then, as was very much the fashion in those days, uh, you moved from hotel kitchen to hotel kitchen uh, to learn your craft. And uh, it was my apprenticeship and I did that for two years. So by the time I was sort of 17, uh, 18, I'd finished college. Uh, and I was going out into the into the real workplace, and I worked in hotels and restaurants, and I really honed my craft and and learnt how to be a chef. Uh, great times, fantastic times, and uh, I, I was so so blessed to to be working with some amazing people who gave of me uh, time, energy, and most importantly, really nurtured the enthusiasm that I had as a young lad which I, I like to think I still have today as a, a rather elderly gentleman. But um, the enthusiasm really did spur me on to, to want to learn more. And I was very, very fortunate. Uh, I entered competitions and uh, I was quite lucky to win those. And these are, these are chef competitions, so cooking and things like that. Um, and then all the while, just really having um, a, a fantastic, fantastic learning opportunity, I suppose. Um, if I can fast forward, because frankly, hearing about me working in several restaurants and kitchens uh, across London is, uh, is probably not that exciting. Um, 
And I think if we go to the next stage, um, which was uh, really becoming my own boss. Okay, yes. Um, so that sounds really interesting. I mean, I just, uh, already just the fact that you started at 14, that's so fascinating. Um, so we're moving on to your entrepreneurial journey. So what is it like being your own boss? Or what was it like, I guess, initially um, starting off as your own boss? Absolutely. Well, I was in my uh, mid-twenties, and uh, I think there's only one word that can describe what it was like. Uh, frightening. Absolutely frightening. I was terrified. But in equal measure, I was excited. I was uh, enthused. I was nervous. But it was a frightening step to go on your own um, with what you think is all of your skills and that you've put in previously to uh, to get to to that point and I, um, I I opened a restaurant uh, in a, an area called Radlett in Hertfordshire and I did that with a, a gentleman who I thought uh, well he was a friend he was a friend and I and he was uh, quite a clever guy he was an estate agent and uh, I, I wasn't still confident in my own academic abilities I was a pretty good cook and I was, uh, I'd like to think, a great motivator of people. I had a great team around me. I brought with me to the restaurant. Uh, my old head waiter from a restaurant we worked at together for a number of years. Uh, I brought together uh, people in the kitchen who I trusted. Uh, and that if I needed to be away from the kitchen, I knew that they would do uh, a fantastic job for me. So I, I had a lot of uh, confidence in that, but I didn't have confidence in my academic ability. And so I um, engaged with a friend and he became my business partner uh, he was an estate agent he had a levels he'd been to university all the things i had not done and um, we had a successful fantastic business uh, our daughter was born at that time her first meal was sitting on one of the restaurant tables eating minestrone um, uh, uh, and, and she's now 28 by the way and she probably wouldn't like me telling you that um, <laughs> So we, we had a really great business. I have to say it was fantastic. We, we were in the heady times uh, of the early 90s where um, it was before the first recession, the first recession that I'd ever uh, been involved in. Uh, and so there was a lot of money around and therefore we had some great customers. And the area that they had the restaurant was quite an affluent area. So we were very, very lucky to get a very um, high spending, high revenue uh, client. Um, about three years into, two years into the business, um, the person who I assumed was a friend uh, and made a business partner uh, decided to, uh, there's a technical word for it, I'll use the less technical word, stuff me. Oh. Um, and he, uh, he stuffed me in quite a, a significant way where in fact suppliers weren't being paid. Uh, VAT, probably the most important supplier of all, i.e. HMRC, uh, they weren't being paid. So it was a pretty, pretty de uh, desperate time. Uh, I was super lucky um, because this experience taught me absolutely the rest of my life's lessons. But the key thing is I had uh, what I would say my second mentor in life, and that's my father-in-law, who was a very, very, very successful business person. And he uh, took me aside and said, right, you've got two choices. You can either fold the business and owe people a lot of money and hold your head in shame for the rest of your life, or you can pull your bootstraps up and we'll deal with it. So we took the latter, we pulled our bootstraps up and we dealt with it. And through his help and through his guidance and working with the banks, we paid off all of the suppliers. We ensured all the staff were absolutely looked after. We dealt with that storm. It took us about a year to get back to break even. So for a year we were trading, but actually not taking any money. The money was being used to repay loans, to repay debts. Um, we, we, we had to do that. Then we continued the business for a further two years after that horrible year uh, where we were having a lot of fun. We got good systems in place. I'd learned how to do um, proper business practice by then. I'd really knuckled down and my father-in-law took me under his business wing as opposed to the family wing, which I'd always been under. Uh, and he really uh, helped me understand how to operate as a businessman. So much so, I was very fortunate uh, that um, a, a company that many of you might know called Pizza Express, the irony is, of course, they're not doing too well now, but uh, Pizza Express, um, they uh, wanted to acquire some properties, uh, existing uh, shops that were between my restaurant 
Um, and the shop to the left of me had done the deal, the shop to the right of me, the hairdresser hadn't quite. But it was the right time for me to accept that deal and I was very fortunate to do that and I did. So came away with a couple of pennies in the bank, uh, which enabled me to take some time off and spend it with my now two kids. Uh, interesting, the hairdresser never sold and he's doing really well, so that's good. Uh, so that was, that was very much um, my, uh, my first steps into um, uh, being my own boss. Uh, before moving on. Yeah, so you mentioned obviously that you had some initial struggles, for example, um, your friend that sort of, what was the word you used? Um, messed you stuck. around and... Um, I, I used the word stuck. stuck. Yeah. <laughs> stuck. Yeah. Um, so what would you say, you know, you, you'd learned from that situation about, I guess, the people that you work with and, you know, I guess when you're starting your own business, the people you surround yourself with, you've even mentioned that you had some like mentors and um, just the importance of that. Yeah, I think, well, great question. I think firstly, mentors are amazing. And uh, I've mentioned two of mine. I've actually got a, uh, another two to mention, which I will do, who, and I, in my life, I'm so lucky. I have four mentors and those four people um, are still with me today as mentors and I still uh, call on them when I need them. So mentoring is absolutely so important. If you can find uh, a great mentor, then uh, I, I think it really does help the career and, and your life as well. But to answer your question specifically, I think what it taught me, and I know it sounds a bit businessy and a bit technical, but I can't think of a better way to describe it. It taught me the due diligence process of business. And that even comes down to when you're working with someone to make them a business partner, to make them part of your co collaborative team. You need to do your due diligence. You need to understand, and what I've learned is their values. Do their values mirror yours? And that's a, a, a lesson that I learned. And I'm so pleased that I, I know this might sound strange, that I went through these struggles and that year of struggle. I'm really, as I look back, I, I'm pleased that that happened. Um, because it taught me some fantastic lessons which guided me to uh, the, the next stage of my, my wonderful journey. That's brilliant. I, I love that you're, you know, taking something away from it rather than seeing it as a setback. It's actually inspiring you to push forward. Um, so what would you say, I mean, you've mentioned so much, but what would you say are the key takeaways from that period of your life? Uh, key takeaways, as I've just said, uh, due diligence, making sure that you, uh, you know people and their value. Um, I think also uh, building trust with your suppliers. So whatever business or industry you're going into, you'll always need a supplier. You'll always need somebody who has something that you need to help you do your service and or product. And the, build, the trust that you can build with your supplier is, is so important because not only do you create a new friend in your life, and we can never have enough friends as, as coronavirus is, is showing us. But I think also um, it, 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 you get a different treatment from your supplier if you treat them and respect them in the same values that you, you wish for yourself. It also does mean from a chef point of view, and this is very, very altruistic, you get a better product. Because mm -hmm. if they like you, you know, your, your um, potato is going to be just that bit better. Your chicken is going to be just that bit smarter and fresher. So there's a lot of benefits. So, so for me, it's, it's really uh, valuing your suppliers, as I've said about the due diligence of the people that you work with. And lastly, um, add value. Add value to whatever you're doing, not only for yourself, but for the people you're serving or providing a service to or the product that you've made that you're selling to them. Add value. If you believe that you're at, what you're doing is adding value to their lives and you can see that value and recognise that value in them, I think that's it. Yeah, so, so did you find it hard being your own boss and sort of almost telling yourself what to do and not having someone else direct you, like being responsible for that? Yeah, uh, you're quite great, great question, Victoria. As I said in, in the very start, um, I was talking about moving into my own restaurant and I used the word frightening. And, and that is part of the fear is, oh, it all, it all starts and stops with me. Um, so, you know, the decisions I make are going to affect everything. It's going to affect the people that are working with me. It's going to affect the customers that come to me. It's going to affect the food I buy, everything. And of yeah. course, my family and, and all of that, you know, at that time when I started, I, I had, um, we were relatively newly married, my wife and I, we had a baby on the way. 
So there was a lot going on. But um, yeah, I think, it, of course, it was frightening. But you get over that fear once you start seeing, hey, I can do this. I can pick the right members of the team to work with me. I can get the right suppliers. My customers are happy. Money is coming into the till, which is always a great um, proof of anything that's working. So yeah, uh, frightening in that way, Victoria. Okay, and then you did mention earlier about there was a point where you kind of had to choose between whether you were going to continue with the business or essentially liquidate, and then you yeah. decided to push through. Um, were there ever any other points where you did actually feel like it was too tough um, and that you potentially wanted to give up? Were there any other moments, even in the early stages? Or uh, I've got to be honest, no. Uh, I know that's probably not the answer people want to hear, but it's the truth. Uh, the only time that I really thought this is time to just jack it in was when, you know, there was no money. Uh, I had people knocking on the door saying, you owe me money. Uh, I had staff saying, how am I going to feed myself? That's when I, I wanted to, truthfully, in those quiet moments, I wanted to run. But as I mentioned, I've got a fantastic mentor number two in my life, uh, Raymond, who, um, who just steered me through it. And uh, I never, ever post that that one moment I've never had uh, and, and that's that's really I guess what took me on to how we we together with my my great friends and partners created WSH yes tell us more about WHS like, sorry tell us more about your brand and the restaurants you've yeah. built you know we'd love to know more okay. about that specifically so we so I sold I sold my single restaurant I had a bit of time off with my uh, my two little kiddies who they were then uh, and so uh, about 25 years ago, uh, we started a business uh, which um, we call WSH, Westbury Street Holdings, as opposed to WHS, which is the stationer. Um, and, uh, it's, a, it's an easy mistake. I, I often do it myself. Uh, Westbury Street Holdings started, uh, we, had, uh, we were a small business. It was very much, uh, the terminology we used was buy and build. So we, would, uh, we had a small business and then we would look at other like-minded companies that wanted to merge in with us and build uh, so we weren't taking companies over we were merging them into the business um, and and growing through organic growth as well as acquisition uh, it is absolutely fair to say that the size of the business uh, 2019 I'm not going to talk about 2020 for a moment but the size of the business 2019 of that approximately 65 percent of that business was organically grown so the remaining percentage was through acquisition. Um, so that's, that's, again, we're something quite, we're quite proud of because we've grown a business from the people within it. And it started with just five of us. And I mentioned my due diligence and I was super lucky. Uh, I, I met um, uh, mentor number three in my life, um, uh, a wonderful guy called us. Just for our viewers, just because some of them might know, what do you mean by acquisition? Oh, okay, sorry. So acquisition meaning that there is a an organization or a company out there that's providing a service which is similar to the area of expertise or service area that we want to be in or are in. Um, and they are, we buy them, we acquire them. So we, we would uh, negotiate a deal with the owners of that business, uh, where we would not only uh, uh, reward them for their, 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 um, their bill, i.e. pay them for their business, but also we brought them into our business. So there they were on Monday, for example, owning their own business. And on Tuesday, they were still owning their own business, but part of a bigger group. And that was always our plan. So every organization that we've acquired or bought or merged into our business, the principal player of that business is still today within our business. So there's a sandwich bar um, primarily around London, but uh, we've, we've got a few around the UK in museums and visitor attractions. It's a sandwich bar called Benugo, B-E-N-G-U-O. If you ever go into um, Victoria, Waterloo, King's Cross, we're there. Now that, that company was started by two brothers, Ben and Hugo Warner. Um, we acquired, bought, merged that business about 15 years ago. And that business today, uh, we, when we acquired it, it was turning over, so it, its revenues were at about 15. These are approximate figures. It was about 15 million. Today, that business is about 110 million. That's just Benugo. But most importantly, the principal players of that, that business, Ben Warner, still runs Benugo. He's also a director of WSH, so he sits with me on the board, but 
he still runs a business that we merged in, acquired some 15 years ago. And I think that's really important because that come back to that due diligence of working with people that share your values. That's part of the lessons that I learned all those years ago. And I continue to learn that today. If you work with people that share your values, and here I'm talking about your personal values, not your business values, your personal values, then you'll find you have a, a great success together. But carrying on, um, hopefully I've answered your question, sorry. Yes, you have, just uh, to ask uh, as well, though, how, as you mentioned about working people that have the same values as you, how do you, how do you ensure that? Like, what, what, how, what advice would you give about making sure that, firstly, you know your own values, um, I guess that, that you have the right values for starting a business and then making sure that you're also partnering with people that do share those values. What advice would you give um, in doing so? Okay. I mean, a great question and not an easy one to answer. I have to be honest with you because I think it's all personal to each individual. But for me, yeah. if you know your own self and sometimes going through some troubles brings out your own understanding of your own values I'm not suggesting that everybody should go through problems. Uh, you know, although, of course, at the moment, we are all experiencing uh, 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 the biggest problem globally, which is this horrible, horrible virus. Um, mm -hmm. And I think actually in these times, when you have moments to reflect because you can't be with other people, you can't go out and socialize, you can't go to restaurants, bars, pubs, coffee bars, discos, or whatever you call them nowadays, um, you're spending a lot of time with yourself. And actually, I would say use this time because you will really start to discover what your values are. Who are you inside? What do you believe in? I'm not talking about being religious, which is absolutely great for everybody that has faith. I absolutely love that. But I'm talking here about understanding who you are in the quietest moment of the day. And I always use this expression, so please forgive me if anybody is offended. But when a person goes to the lavatory that is the one place in the house or the flat where you are completely alone when you go to the loo you're on your own and i have got to tell you something i have had some of the best ideas going to the loo and you, what i mean by that is it's a quiet space it's an area where no one can infiltrate your brain and you start to develop your values i'm not saying go to the toilet to find your values i'm just saying find that quiet space and that quiet space and you know for me my values it I, I care about i passionately care about people and, and and i can't exist without people this 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 quarantine for me is awful because i i have to be surrounded by people i i, I need people to breathe um and that's a, a very important value for me the next one that i discovered at a very very early age is uh, after <laughs> i've gone through some mistakes is the value of how can I be as good as the person that I most respect or the people that I most respect? How can I follow their lights? How can I follow their guidance? And as I said, I have been so blessed to have great mentors in my life. And I looked to them and I thought, goodness, that's, that's, that's what I want to be like. I want to emulate their approach to life, their approach to dealing with people, their approach to business. And so, that's how I, I discovered my values. I'm not saying that works for everybody, but I've taken that on. And obviously you build and you add values um, periodically through your life. Uh, uh, coronavirus is teaching me values I never even considered. And, and one of those being is that actually I can exist momentarily without a hug. I'm not good at it, but I'm learning. I can exist without a hug. But coming on to the, and I know it's a, pretty much a major part of this this talk today is the, is the business we created wsh so there we were 25 years ago we had you know pretty much zero as a business um, and what we did is through a lot of hard work by having great people working with us we built and we did some acquisition or merging buying of those companies we built a business to be um very very successful Turnover is vanity. Turnover is all very exciting. The reality of life is that profit is the important thing because you know any company can say they got a billion pound turnover, which is brilliant and should be applauded. But it's actually the profit you're making. How are you making sure that you're paying for your staff correctly, you're looking after your suppliers, 
you're making sure that you're adding value to absolutely everybody that you're providing a service to. Because if you're doing all of those things right, you will make the right profit. Because without profit, you can't run a business. Turnover doesn't pay the bills. Profit pays the bills. So for me, yes, focus on growing your business. Focus on the top line. Focus on serving customers, making people happy, delivering a service, exceeding expectation, adding value. But always remember, you're doing this for a primary reason. And the primary reason is to make a profit, to keep your business sustainable so that you can care for your staff, look after your suppliers. This is very important. And too many organizations have failed because they have focused so much on having massive turnover. Look how fantastic I am. And if anybody has read the press over the last 48 hours, you would have seen about Virgin Atlantic. Virgin Atlantic have chased that turnover uh, holy ground for a number of years. But here we are in uh, 2020 and they're in trouble. And of course, we can all say it's the coronavirus. But it, where was their profit line? Where was their stability? Where, these are the questions to ask because, and I'm not dissing Sir Richard Branson, goodness me, he's an amazing, fantastic gentleman who's created some of the best companies and looked after millions of people globally. So I'm not being discourteous to him. And he doesn't run Virgin, he's the face of Virgin. My point being, turnover is great. Profit is how you look after your company, your people, your suppliers, and you keep going, you keep sustainable. And that's important. And I that's guess really that would, sorry. Yeah, no, it's interesting because as I'm hearing, I, I completely understand um, your advice, obviously, is that it is about the customer making sure you're giving, delivering an amazing service. But then when you think about business and, and obviously profit margins, you, you sometimes do worry. Um, so, for example, as you said, we've been seeing in the news recently about um, all these big companies that haven't necessarily got a plan in place to look after their staff, for example. But then it, it, it's that challenge, isn't it? Like, how do you, I guess, how as a business leader, do you make sure that, you know, you're, you are making profit, but at the same time, you are also investing in your staff? Like, how do you get the balance? Brilliant, brilliant question. First things first is you've got to make sure that your overheads are managed. So how do you, how do you ensure you're making a profit? Obviously, you've got to do the top line stuff. So make sure you're doing a, right, a great product and a great service that brings the customers in. So makes the till ring, to use that expression. So that's, that's the bringing the money in, bringing the revenue in. But then you've got to make sure that you're not wasting what you're making. So buy properly. So with your suppliers, make sure you're buying the best products. And within our organization, for example, we primarily buy local produce. And by that, we mean... It's produced within these aisles, the UK. That means we're paying less for transportation of the product to our kitchens. Additionally, it has a sustainable benefit in terms of the environment and the ecology, which is super, super important. We also have over many, many, many years spent a significant proportion of our profit on training our teams. We have in our company, and I am proud and I will boast on this daily, we have the most enthusiastic, highly trained, motivated teams anywhere in our industry. They are the blood, the heartbeat, the life of our business. These ladies, gentlemen, gender specific, gender neutral people that work with us are the exact reason that we are successful, nothing else. We have put the energy, we have put the uh, revenue, and we have put the ability for them to have training, to have development, and to have succession. But the rest of it is down to them, their enthusiasm, and their willingness to want to get on. And I think because they've watched what Alistair Story, who's our chairman, and my mentor number three in life, and probably the most amazing gentleman, when I was lucky enough to receive a, an industry award in 2017 for being an old man, they, they call it outstanding contribution. It basically means you're very old. Um, when I was lucky to win that award, the very first thing I did after thanking my wife, because I'm not stupid, was I thanked him. I thanked him because he, in 25 years, has taken me, and the 23,000 people that we are lucky enough to call our colleagues and employees, he's taken us on a journey of absolute amazing fun, joy, 
And we are looking after so many happy customers that it, it fills our heart every day that we've got happy customers and really brilliantly trained, enthusiastic teams. So that's how we've done it. No, no magic dust. It's just having great people. Oh, work for you, Simon. You sound amazing. Um, I um, do have a question. We, we do have, we do have, uh, we, I can put you in and I'll put our website up and you can come and join. Okay. We're always looking for great people. Oh, thank you. I have a question actually, um, just um, from one of our viewers. One of them, can you explain what turnover is? Um, okay. Just so they understand the difference. Yeah, a uh, really uh, simple way of explaining turnover. It's the money coming into the till. It's the top line. The bottom line is profit. So you've got turnover. That's all the cash coming in. So if you're selling spanners um, and your spanner is costing the customer £10, uh, that £10 comes to you. That's part of your turnover. Then what you've got to do is deduct the cost of making that spanner. So it's the cost of the metal. It's the cost of distribution. It's the cost of the staff who've made it for you. It's the cost of the packaging. And maybe that all comes down. And that £10, to make £10 turnover, cost me, for example, just to keep the numbers simple, £5. That leaves me with £5 of profit before tax. Because you've always got to pay the tax. Does that help answer your question? Yes, well, I, 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 it makes absolute sense. And I have another one. Um, did you work, like, did you have like a work-life balance? Did you work like seven days a week, crazy hours, and like maybe at the start and now? Like, did, what was that like, like your working days um, from Bri start brilliant, until- like, Brilliant, brilliant question, brilliant question. And I gotta tell you, if my wife was here, she would give you a, a, a truthful answer. So I'll give you my answer. Uh, in the early days, I probably worked uh, 24-7, I mean, I was mad. I just could not stop. Uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure everything was so right in the restaurant. When we started WSH, uh, I never took a holiday. Uh, number one, I couldn't afford it. I've got to be honest. I couldn't afford to go on holiday. Um, uh, but I was just focused, um, completely, completely focused on it's all about building the business. And I was, uh, it was actually, we were at a, a kind of a company social thing that we still do today. We have a lot of social things. We're in hospitality, so we're always hugging each other. But uh, we had a company social thing. And one of my uh, business colleagues said to my wife, um, you know, you really should organize a holiday uh, because he'll, he'll never do it. And she was busy, you know, being a mum and working and, uh, and doing all the stuff that young people do. And he, uh, he said, I think, he said, Melanie, I think you need to just get on with it. And so she, he didn't say it in a hard way. He said it with love. And, uh, and she did. And from that day onwards, we started taking two holidays a year, a week in the summer and a week in the winter. And as the years went on, the week became two weeks, three weeks. And here we are today. I'm quite lucky that I'm very, very, very lucky to say that I can, I, I have, uh, we have, uh, a family home overseas and we're very very fortunate to be able to spend a few weeks a year there and so I take a lot more holidays now than I ever did. Nice so would you say at the beginning I guess when you are starting your own business um, or even just stepping into a new industry you might have to put in the extra hours and um, sacrifice maybe the odd holiday just to get to a place where you're maybe a bit more secure in your in your industry or your business? I think, well, for me, I can't speak for everybody, but I, uh, my belief is that uh, if you're doing something you love, if you're doing something which is important to you, uh, you just, you want to work all the hours God sends because you want to make, make a success. And for me, I wanted to make sure that I was providing for my family, uh, leaving a legacy, not a legacy like, you know, something on a stone wall saying, hey, look what Simon did, but a legacy for my family so that my kids have a better life than I had. I had a great childhood, but I want them, you know, as a parent, you always want your kids to have more than you had, if it's possible. So that for me is the legacy. My children, um, is, that is my legacy. So I, I was focused on that from a very early age. Mm, that's great. Um, you spoke earlier about, you know, I guess, current climate and what's happening and, yep. you know, with, COVID, um, you know, with everything on it feels like a bit uncertain. And I think obviously the hospitality industry um, has had an, it's had an impact on, on that industry and loads of other industries. 
Um, as someone in this industry, how do you deal with that kind of uncertainty? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's had, had, had a massive detrimental effect. I mean, it's off a cliff. You know, we spent 25 years building a business, 26 years building a business, and it just went like that. Um, it was, it, it, you know, five, six weeks ago, that was a pretty hard time. But we're resilient uh, and we are, uh, we are optimistic and we're positive. And I would say to anybody out there, and especially, I've got to tell you, if you are a, a young person from 16 to 25, this is your time. This is your time. What a great time to uh, see the opportunities that are going to come once we are through this tragic and awful period. I, I'm not in any way diminishing how serious um, coronavirus is. Uh, millions of people worldwide uh, have, have died because of this, this awful virus. But the experts will find a way, the, the scientists will find a way, and we will all begin to resume our lives again. It won't be the same, but we will resume. And my coffee bars will open, our restaurants will open, and people will start to socialize and enjoy it again. But what we've done to answer your question specifically, Victoria, is we immediately took steps um, to ensure that as many, many as possible of our staff were looked after. The government in the United Kingdom has been amazing. Um, uh, Rishi Sunak has, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, has been phenomenal, as has our Prime Minister, because they have created this furlough scheme, which is allowing employers like us to be able to retain our brilliant, highly enthusiastic, brilliantly motivated teams, so that when this is over, and it will be soon, I promise you this will be soon, then we'll all have, be coming back. But I want to just say something, because across our business, we have got, and they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram, they're on all the social, I don't even know what Tiki Tok is, they're on all these things, right? Uh, they, are, they are producing meals, delivery, etc., for the NHS personnel, carer personnel, and all the ancillary personnel that are keeping our world going, so many of the people that work with me that I am blessed to say are my working colleagues are in kitchens now making food that will today be somebody's lunch who's a carer, somebody's lunch who's an NHS member of the team, be it a cleaner, a porter, uh, a delivery person, a nurse, a doctor, and so on. And I think that really just shows that in our business, not only have we looked after all of our staff, and it comes back to what I said earlier on, if you look after your people and you look after your suppliers, you will have a sustainable business. And even through this period, we are making sure that our staff are okay. We've created an online forum where they can join, rather like Zoom, but it's for our people. And they can come and join, and we have lots of chats every day of the week. Our mindfulness and well-being program that we've always had as a business, that is absolutely uh, there to support all of our staff. And then I, I would just say finally, and I know that there's a brilliant, brilliant charity that's uh, going to benefit from this fantastic uh, Spring Pod uh, event now. But I just want to say that I'm, I'm blessed and, and gifted enough uh, to, to be able to be a trustee and a patron of a, a, a charity called Hospitality Action, which is a, a charity that helps those that are um, less fortunate uh, in the world of hospitality. If someone works in hospitality, whatever level it is, then they can come to Hospitality Action and we do look after them. Not will, do look after them. And uh, I'm, I'm spending a lot of my time uh, during this period of, uh, uh, of splendid isolation, um, making sure that I, I can help in whatever way I can. So for me, the future is absolutely brilliant. For, and, and why I've mentioned that age group of 18 to 25, I can tell you now, the workplace is going to need fantastic, strong, youthful minds that want to share their passion, want to share their enthusiasm. And whatever sector it is, they are going to be the winners because customers want service. Customers want supplies. And everybody at that age group is the right energy and the right enthusiasm to deliver that.
That's fantastic. I love your optimism and, and also that you mentioned that you're having these like regular catch-ups on Zoom with them and you've got this mindfulness and wellbeing um, program. That is um, absolutely phenomenal and it really shows that you are looking after your staff. Um, but then also practically, I know that we've obviously mentioned the government are going to be um, supporting businesses and helping them by furloughing staff. But um, how would you say you are adapting as a business um, when it comes to the plans ahead? Have you been thinking about, you know, when lockdown's lifted, how you will operate as a business? Um, will there be any changes? Uh, to answer the question in two stages, firstly, uh, are we thinking about it? Yes, uh, it consumes uh, pretty much every, every moment of, of our week. Um, we, uh, as a board, uh, we have regular meetings. Uh, so we have an operational board and then uh, another board. So the operational board are having uh, daily um, calls, Zooms, all those sort of things, um, where they're looking at strategies and opportunities. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, to go into those now would, would breach confidences, so I, I can't really do that. But uh, I would just say that be assured, as a business, uh, across all of our brands, from CS's to Benugo, Baxter Story, um, and Cater, Cater Link, and so on, all of our brands, all of the heads of those brands, are um, meeting uh, daily for what we're calling a catch-up, just to make sure that everybody's okay in their teams. And then we are having uh, forward planning meetings. Uh, yeah, so that's the first part. Yes, we are meeting and planning. The second part uh, to your question is, yes, it's going to be different when we go back. And I think initially, as human beings, we're going to be a little wary. We've been, um, we've been asked to separate from people now for a, over a month. And it's probably going to be three months, really, by the time we get back out into the, um, the, the bigger world. And so we've got to learn how to re-engage. And that, that, that's going to take us a little time. Not long, but it's going to take us a little time. And already, if you look at, uh, and I'm sure many of the people watching this today are already going to perhaps a supermarket or a corner shop or maybe a pharmacy, uh, the, the stores and, and places that are open, already we're, we're, we're acting in a different way. And I think that's going to carry on for quite a while. I think we're going to maintain this social distancing of a two metre gap uh, for, for quite a period to come. I'm no expert. Uh, I know nothing uh, about science, but I just feel human nature is going to take a while to get over that. And that will affect our business because we're in the business of serving people and engaging with them. And I think our coffee bars will open first and I think we'll trade well because I think people are desperate mm -hmm. for great coffee. And if you are, go to Ben, we go. <laughs> Waterloo, Victoria, Houston, we're all over the place. You, you can find us. If you go to, I think museums, I think they're going to open up again because I think people are, have been, um, have been starved of culture. You know, uh, I, I know that the media and TV world is great and uh, wonderful things that they're doing on, on television, but frankly, a little bit of culture, even for a, a Luddite like me, you, you just want to sometimes go and look at some great art or a wonderful statue or a beautiful uh, sculpture. So I think museums will open and that will help my business as well because we, we provide services within the V&A, the science, the history and so on, the Holber Museum in, in Bath. Um, in, uh, yes, in Bath is the, uh, the pump room. Sorry, we've got a few. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll, we'll recover. It'll take time. Uh, and final answer to that is I think by January 2021, we'll all be back to regular normal. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, another question for you, Simon. Uh, obviously for students, this must be quite a scary time, especially for those that have, you know, maybe they're leaving college, university or wherever, and they're like, oh, can't wait to start, you know, my new job. But with everything yeah. going on and the uncertainty, it's, it's petrifying, I guess, uh, for some. Yeah. So what advice would you give to them? I know you said it's their time to shine, but what practical advice would you give? Okay, um, great question. Uh, I wish I was a student. I really do at this time. I, I really do. I, I mean, I don't regret being where I am in my life today. I'm very lucky, but I really wish I was sort of, 2025 20, again now because you know you've got such skills you, you've learned so much through your studies you've you've engaged with the with great tutors you, you've learned uh, a heck of a lot you know so much and you can take those learnings you can take those skills whilst there is this period of uncertainty and I can only talk about industries that I know about I don't know about a lot of other industries so please forgive me if it's very specific but you right now, with all the skills you've got, 
You can, and they are desperate for people to work with them. Supermarkets, distribution sites, other large organizations really are looking for talented people, enthusiastic people to get involved. Now, you might be sitting there going, what's this jerk talking about? I've just taken a degree in this or I've studied for that. Of course you have, and you won't forget that. But if you can get into the workplace, if you can get into doing something, not only does it absolutely help your own mindfulness because you're engaging your brain, your brilliant brain that you've spent the last few years developing and honing the skills and the talent that you've now got, you can put that to use. And you might think he's a crazy person. Stacking shelves? No, but you'll stack the best shelf. Your shelf will be the smartest, truest shelf in the supermarket. You'll make sure that the delivery, if you do delivery, is the sharpest, smartest delivery because you are talented. When this period is over, and it won't be long now, you take those learnings. It's another skill. And you come to an employer like us and you say, oh, so during COVID, what I did is I, um, I went and worked at Tesco's. Uh, and this is what I did. And I was there for three weeks. And then they said, oh, crumbs, you're quite good. Could you do this? And what that shows a prospective employer is not only are you super smart through your studies, but you're actually thinking. You're thinking, how can I be different? And being different gets you the right job. Wow. Uh, that's honestly, Simon, you've shared so much wisdom. I'm personally inspired. Um, oh, you've you. got an incredible career story. Um, and I think there are a lot of messages in there for all of us um, to take away and think about. Your story also emphasizes the importance of knowing what you want to do and um, that hard work and passion are very essential for success. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, but we're going to now move on to some questions from our viewers that they've been sending in. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Nathan, who wants to know, um, why did you want to be a chef and also your own boss? Okay, Nathan, thank you very, very much for the question. And I should have covered this and I'm really appreciative that you've asked it. Um, None of you will know this person, so you'll all have to go on YouTube, but there's a Canadian TV chef called Graham Kerr. Great guy. I was, as a young kid, I used to watch this guy on TV. Uh, and by the way, we're talking black and white was still around. Color was just coming in. Um, we didn't have YouTube and all those things that you've got today. But this guy, he used to cook uh, on TV, like you see Jamie Oliver doing and all these guys today. But he did this cooking. And at the end of the show, he'd made the meal. And let's say it was uh, roast chicken. He would then walk out and go to the audience and bring somebody out and sit them at a little table that had a gingham tablecloth on it. And they would eat this meal. And the joy on the person's face that was eating it, something happened in me and I thought, I want to do that. I want to be the person that makes someone do that. That's why I became a chef. That is so interesting. I love that. Um, true story. Look, true. Very true. I love how specific it is. Some people it's sort of more, you know, general, but that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, a simple guy. Oh, no, it's, it, 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 uh, I love, I love how you share your story. Um, I've got another question from Ryan who wants to know, how do I get a supplier to start a company? I think what they mean is how, I guess, how they start working with suppliers when they're, when they're starting their business? Okay, uh, good question again, Ryan, thank you. Uh, first thing I would say is that you, if you're starting a business, um, you'll, you'll know the type of suppliers that you need to go to. Uh, you'll, so if it's a catering business, you'll know you'll need a butcher, a fishmonger and so on and so on. If, if it's making spanners, I guess you need someone that makes metal, I don't know. Um, so you'll know the type of suppliers. What I would then do is find out where they are. Obviously, Google's a wonderful thing. Uh, look them up, um, engage with them initially on a telephone conversation, and then I would ask them to, to have a meeting. And I know we can't do that at the moment in COVID. So obviously the meeting, if you're doing it now, is going to be via Zoom. But uh, I, I would suggest that you, you have a meeting. And again, go back to what I said a, a lot earlier. If you understand your own values and you know who you are as a person, Try and elicit that out of the conversation you're having with this potential supplier. It's not always about, can I buy your product at the lowest price? It's how will you 
look after me so that I can service my customers the best. And that way we all have added value. And sometimes if you're really in an early startup business, you might want to say to the supplier, you could bootstrap on. Um, if there anybody, does everybody know what I mean by bootstrap? I think explain just in case. That... Okay, so bootstrap basically say to the supplier, look, if you, if you work with me, I can tell you that I've got this amount of business that I think I'm going to get in. So for a period of time, why don't you give me preferential rate so you bootstrap on to my shoes and let's see what happens and you walk with me on the journey. Now, you've got to have, you know, you, your supplier's got to be entrepreneurial. Everybody's got to buy into the same gig, but it, it can happen. And funny enough, I'm just uh, mentoring through my, my business that I set up on the side called Uncommon Sense. Um, I'm just mentoring a small uh, SME. Uh, and that's exactly what we've just done with three suppliers. Uh, we're bootstrapping them onto the business and um, we'll see what happens. Brilliant. I hope that answers the well, question, I, Ryan. Yes, we've got, we've got a question from Aidan. Um, they would like to know, do you ever compete with Gordon Ramsay or Jamie Oliver and do you want to take inspiration from them? <laughs> or do you take inspiration from them? Okay, uh, competing, no. Um, because I, I, as a business, we compete and for the word compete, I'm going to use a different word, which is respect. We respect all of our competition that's out there. Um, they've, all, they've all done a great thing already, which is starting a business. Maybe like Jamie, they've had, and Gordon, they've both had some challenges, but actually they've bounced right back. Um, so we respect our competitors. We don't compete against them. Uh, obviously, business is business. Um, there's enough out there for everybody. Um, so we, we, we respect them, and, and then we compete. Uh, it, it, sorry, what was the second part of the question, Victoria? Sorry. I'm reading quite a few questions that have come through. Um, the second part was, do you take inspiration from them? Ah, sorry. Yes. End of. <laughs> I can add one thing. I can add one thing. So this is how inspired Jamie Oliver. I love Jamie Oliver. He's doing a TV show. Um, it was on the other week. And he did this pan, deep pan pizza. I never made that in all my years. I made it. Wow. So yes, I'm very inspired by these talented individuals. Um, I have a question from Emerald. Um, she wants to know what's more important, work experience in general or work experience in your specific sector? The first. So or work, especially during this time. You, maybe you won't be able to get the experience in your specific sector. So I would just say getting out there and working is the most important thing you can do because you are engaging and learning and you're learning skills that will come back to your specific sector. If, of course, we weren't in COVID, I would say, if you can get something in your specific sector, then do try that. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, another one is a bit more specific to now. Um, how do you keep up a successful routine when stuck in lockdown? This is also a question I have for you as well myself. How do you keep it up? Okay, um, so Victoria, you'll know this. Uh, I've got a dog. Yes. Because uh, you saw him earlier. Uh, our dog, Buddy, uh, otherwise known as Buddy the Wonder Dog, um, he is our routine um, because Buddy needs to go out for walks. Um, so we have a routine of taking, in fact, my wife just went a moment ago. Uh, so we have a routine of taking Buddy for a long walk in the morning and another long walk in the afternoon. So he's, he used to be a great Dane, but he's now um, a, a chihuahua. His legs are so short. Um, <laughs> but no, no. Um, so the dog helps us with routine. Secondly, um, I, I do uh, twice a week, I do a workout, in, uh, a sort of health workout uh, in the gym um, with my uh, friend of mine who's a personal trainer. So we do it on a video link, like a, a WhatsApp um, video thing. Uh, so that helps my routine. The other thing is I, uh, so I'm talking to you in my office that I'm very, very, very lucky to have at home. And I know many people don't have uh, many of the joyful, lucky things that I have. So I have a space at home, which is my office. And I'm in here at about 7 a.m. That's not because I'm a hero. I wake up at five. I'm an old man. Old people get up early. Um, I'm in here at seven. I go through all my emails. Um, and there aren't that many today because uh, it's just a quiet day today, I think. People are back at school or homeschooling their kids. So I go through my emails. I then look at the plan I've got for the rest of the week, what have I got to do? Who have I got to engage with? Have I got to prepare anything? Um, so I try to keep that routine. I always stop, I always stop at midday because I then cook 
for my wife and I lunch because it's just the two of us in the house. Our kids have got their own homes and married and stuff. So uh, I cook lunch for my wife. And then while we're eating, I say to her, what should we have for dinner? Uh, I then come back to work. Sometimes I go on Jamie Oliver or Gordon Ramsay or other chefs to get some inspiration for dinner. And then at about uh, four o'clock, we walk the dog. And at 5.30, I start cooking dinner. That's my routine. Oh, wow. I do have a glass of, I have a glass of wine every night at eight o'clock. Do you know what, Simon, this is all so amazing. And there's so many more questions we all want to ask, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Um, no I just want to say thank you so much for taking out the time well. of your commitments to share your incredible story. Um, and obviously that brings us to the end of our Learn Alarm session. Um, just a reminder that we're also raising funds for the Children's Trust, which is the UK's leading charity for children with brain injury. Their ambition is to ensure that all children with brain injury and neurodisability have the opportunity to live the best life possible. And every donation goes towards helping these children with their rehabilitation. If you'd consider donating, no matter how small the amount, please do so via the link on your screen now. Thank you for your support and for watching. Um, and do remember to share the word about Learn Lounge. Um, and don't forget to tune in at 2.30 this afternoon for a talk with Thomas McComsky, where he'll talk about a career in, tech, in the tech industry and tell you the importance of finding your own path. Um, thanks again, Simon. And I will see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you.